I think you're either going to have to embrace the this time's different mentality, which is a very risky thing to do, or side with history, which says when you go to an enormous sudden tightening, as we've seen, there will be harm to the real economy. And I think we're going to see that. This is unusual for me. You know, I'm not Mr. You know, crystal ball predictions and clickbait headlines for you, David. But I think we're going to see this this year. The recession you and I have spoken about, I think it's there. I think it's happening. I think it's masked by labor hoarding. But I think it will be undeniable this year with large scale implications for investors in everything, not just gold stocks and mining. And just because the world hasn't collapsed from the banking crisis that we've seen, it doesn't mean that the worst is over just yet. Lobel Tigre is here with us today. He is uh, the due diligence guy on Twitter, and he runs the independentspeculator.com. Uh, check out both. We'll put links in the description below. Uh, Lobo, always great to see you. Welcome to my new show, The David Lim Report. Excited to speak to you about not just commodities, but also the economy, stocks, and the Federal Reserve today. I'm happy to be on with you. I've seen the show take off and I congratulate you for the new platform. It's exciting to see a, a young entrepreneur making good with his skills. Thank you. Congratulations to your service as well. You were telling me offline that uh, you're growing steadily, so that's great. Uh, let's start by talking about uh, the economy. You and I have spoken several times in the last year, but I want to draw uh, the viewers' attention to a conversation we had about seven months ago where you were discussing the possibility of the Federal Reserve continuing their rate hikes. You were right in that prediction. You also told me that they would do so at the risk of the economy until something breaks. Uh, let's do a report card check on the economy. Has something broken? Yet? Yes-ish, and no, not really, would be my okay. answer. Um, the, actually, before we go there, we'll go there because it's important. It matters to our yeah. investment. I always want to remind people that I am a due diligence guy. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm yeah. not a professional economist. And really, given the track record of professional economists lately, that's probably a good thing for an economic discussion. Uh, but I just want to put that out there. Okay, These are, these are my views. They inform how I'm putting my own money into play, but take them with a grain of salt. So, you know, I wasn't the only one who said the Fed was going to tighten. You know, they, they were screaming. The Fed itself was saying so. Everybody expected it to continue. The record pace of it, I think, shocked pretty much everybody, including myself. I didn't see them going 500 basis points in a year. And I think that that's worth really thinking about. And it answers the other part of your question. Because people, they commonly say, oh, well, you know, Volcker did it. He jacked rates from 15 to 20%. That's 5%. Yeah, but 15 to 20% is A, a 33% difference. B, it's already from very, very high to even higher. That going from zero to five is massive. Or mathematically, it's like infinite. To go from zero to anything is an enormous change. And never mind the mathematical change, a world in which in, uh, rates have been kept artificially low, basically nailed to the floor for years, to suddenly having real rates is changing many, many things. And I'm not the only one to say this, but I'm I'm on this uh, bandwagon or group that says you, you can't do that. You can't take people off their addiction to cheap money without something breaking, bad things happening. And the way you frame this question, I think, is very important because there's a there's a narrative out there that the Fed did break something, the uh, medium-sized bank crisis that we had, and it's resolved. And so there's this idea out there, well, the Fed broke something, it wasn't so bad. The economy's still strong, it's resilient, everything's fine, it's safe to get back in the water, buy equities. I, I think this is a huge mistake. I think people who drink that Kool-Aid are taking a lot more risk than they realize. Um, you know, that, that kerfuffle with the banks, I think is, is the overture at most to something breaking. Uh, you know, we can we can write a story, David, or two about what might break next. But I think just in principle, I think you're either going to have to embrace the this time's different mentality, which is a very risky thing to do, or side with history, which says when you go to an enormous sudden tightening, as we've seen, there will be harm to the real economy. And I think we're going to see that this is unusual for me. You know, I'm not Mr. You know, crystal ball predictions and clickbait headlines for you, David. But I think we're going to see this this year. The recession you and I have spoken about, I think it's there. I think it's happening. I think it's masked by labor hoarding. But I think it will be undeniable this year with large scale implications for investors in everything, not just gold stocks and mining. This is just something I've noticed for people in media. 
whenever I put something like the recession is coming or the recession is approaching us this year, next year, doesn't matter what the time frame is, one of the more common comments I get is that this is not news to us because, David, we already are in a recession. Stop telling us what we already know. Uh, can we evaluate that sentiment? Are we already in a well, recession? I think, I think that speaks to your audience. And, yeah. you know, sure, gold bugs and people like me, we've been calling this for a while. I know I'm not the only one, um, but we are the minority and it matters. Here's, here's the thing. There's so many things that are like this where, like take CPI. It's a government manipulated number. You know, even by the government's own standards, they've changed the rules for what it measures. And that's what, what do you mean government manipul- What do you mean manipulated number? How did they manipulate this number? But, well, that's where I'm going. Like I think the manipulations with the hedonic adjustments and all the changes to the formula since 1980, I view that as manipulation. But on top of that, there's people that say that they're just flat out lying. Like the numbers the PLS pulled out, they're 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 made up. They're not real. Like if you could if you could access the real data that they have access to, you would come out with a different CPI number. This is a belief out there, but we're getting off the side point. I, I'm not taking sides on that. What I'm saying is, you know, most of the people in my audience and perhaps in yours are as skeptical as I am of CPI, but the traders on the COMEX who, who trade gold futures contracts and silver futures contracts and other metals contracts in, in the LME, they look at these numbers and they take them seriously. So we can say that CPI is a load of dingo's kidneys or, or, we can say that of course we're in a recession, but if the mainstream doesn't and and their trades are what set the prices that affect our investments, we can't afford to ignore that. So so understand, you know, apply the filter, understand that it's not reliable information, but also understand that this is an input that people are trading and that affects the price of the commodities underlying our resource speculations. Let me ask you this question, uh, Lobo. We know that the official government definition of a recession is two quarters of negative GDP. Actually, that's not always true. Actually, for for 2020, there's only been one negative quarter of GDP growth, and that was that was a recession. Uh, but generally speaking, that is the textbook rule. Uh, we already had that last year, and that wasn't a recession either. Um, so. Who knows anymore? But anyway, my, my question well, is, Lobo. But, but wait a minute, was wasn't it? I mean, you've got even on the mainstream, some people are talking about rolling recession, right? There's some areas that clearly are in recession, and not only did we get the two quarters of negative GDP, we had housing tank when the rates went up for a while. It's coming back at the moment, but we had a lot of economic harm. And you look at the the yield curve inversion, you look at the leading indicators. There's a lot of indications of recession out there. So I think it's, I. Th- I think that the labor market is this one-legged stool I've been talking about before with you of, that the whole economy is wobbling on. I think that's a mistake. Um, but the other thing is the NBER that declares the official recession, they say it's much more than two quarters. So this textbook definition of two quarters, it's not actually the official definition. Yeah, you're right. The, the <laughs> NBER looks at a lot of other fact. You're right. The NBER looks at a lot of other factors besides just you know quarterly declines in GDP. But this is my ultimate question, Lobo. Is I guess this is more philosophical. Is a recession something that is declared by uh, either the NBER or the government or other economists, or is it something that people can feel? There you go. Yes, I, I, you're spot on, David. Whatever the NBER says, which by the way is always after the fact. They, they always say, oh, by the way, we've now concluded that, you know, that pain we felt a year ago or six months ago, that was a recession or that's when it started. So I, I think it's, it's, you know, manifestly silly to wait for the MBER or, or just to even care about whatever their official declaration are. Uh, you, you, you walk down the street, you see the, the, the closed businesses, you go in the store, you see the high prices, you see people trading down, you see major retailers like Walmart, Target, and others reporting that their customers are trading down and that you know people who wouldn't shop at their stores before, more expensive places, they're now shopping, you know, and the you know, product substitution, which which by the way is one of those hedonic adjustments. If you trade chicken for steak because steak's too expensive, well, guess what? This that doesn't affect the CPI, but it affects you in the real world. You didn't want chicken; you wanted steak, and you didn't get it because it's too expensive. So, I, I think this supports the view that I have, and I think much of our audience has that. Yeah, in the real world, where things really matter, there is a recession. 
So let's go back to my first question again.、Uh, what exactly has broken in our economy, if there has been anything yet? Has the Fed been responsible? Well, this is, I guess, a separate question. But has、right. the Fed been responsible for any economic deterioration that we've seen? Yes, long and variable lags. It takes a while. I do think that the banking crisis or, or panic, however you want to call it, was a sign of this. I mean, it, it is clearly mechanically related to interest rates rising much faster than they expected. You know, they 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 borrowed long, lent short, and and mark to market the assets they had long were underwater, and. They didn't have time to adjust. Normally, I mean, it, central banks are normally pretty stodgy about these things. Twenty-five、uh, basis points, and you just keep doing it as the normal course. A fifty basis point hike would have been a jumbo hike, but you know, even more than that is an unheard of. And jumbo hikes back to back. So, in a way, it's kind of not the bank's fault. We say, you know, though they're mismanaged, they did all these things wrong,、uh, but they had been encouraged to buy government bonds as the safest things they could. And the rules of the game changed on them faster than their business model changed. So it's it's quite understandable, and that is, I think, a case of very directly Fed caused change that did harm. And I think that that the important thing is though to take that as just an example. That's one that we now see. I didn't predict that, by the way. You know, you know, just like the guilt thing, nobody really called that before it happened. But once it happened, everybody said, "Oh yeah, that's obvious. That's a that's a knock on effect." I think there will be more things like this. Uh, in the months immediately ahead, before the end of this year, we're going to see more things break. Do I have the crystal ball to tell you which one it is, David? No, not really. But the one that not only I but others are looking at, and that I find compelling, is the commercial real estate market.、Uh, and and they, you know, there's a story there that oh well, this isn't really the Fed. It's because of the the post pandemic exodus, right? All the cities are emptying out because people moved out, and not all of them are coming back. So. So that's bad for commercial real estate in big big cities, and I'm sure that's part of the story. But I'm also quite certain that higher rates are a big part of it. I mean, there's a headline. I don't know if you saw this just this week or a few days ago. The owner of the largest hotel in San Francisco walked away, just gave the keys back to the bank. This isn't Joe Schmo with his little house in, you know, Peoria, Illinois, giving the keys back to the to the local bank. This is. <laughs> This is a large real estate enterprise walking away on half a billion dollars,、um, or am I got my numbers? Is it billion? Yeah, billions of dollars. It's just this huge thing where they just put the keys in the mail and said, "You know what? This is your problem, Mister Banker."、Um, I, I think this is very—it's、uh, a straw in the wind right now, but I think it's a sign of more breakage to come. And and the commercial real estate, I think, will be one area where we、we'll、see that. Can I? Can I? Can we make the stretch that the the fate of commercial real estate really rests on how effective it is that companies will push their employees back to the office? Take a look at this headline. Just came out yesterday. Google to crack down on office attendance asks remote workers to reconsider. All right. Google plans to crack down on employees who haven't been coming into its offices consistently. The company updated its hybrid work policy Wednesday and includes tracking office badge attendance, confronting workers who aren't coming in when they're supposed to, and including the attendance and employees' performance reviews. <laughs> They really want to make good use of the rent. <laughs> Big Brother is watching,、um, but but. The way I、And、see it, everyone does is, this. They're, yeah, they're clearly, there clearly will be more people going back to office somewhat, but that doesn't undo the change. Like it's it's a paradigm shift, and when you realize, you know, even Google, they're not asking people to come back to the office office five days a week, even.、Uh, so I just I just see this as a one way change, and you know, the, the end of the pandemic lockdowns doesn't. Doesn't mean everybody wants to go back to working in office. Once you realize you don't have to, and honestly, as an employer, I don't even have an office. So never mind the trends or whatever. I, I built my business from the get go without an office, and I I have no employees other than myself and my wife, just contractors. And I don't I don't give them equipment. I don't give them an office.、Uh, I just say, give me the results. I'm contracting with you for these results. I don't care how they do it. I don't care if they have five other full time jobs. All I care for is that I get what I pay for, and I'm fine with that. I, I think this is a, this is not going back. The genie's not going back in the bottle, David. 
I'll give you another paradigm shift that people were talking about, which is the rise of AI and how that's going to cut down on the number of employees per company. I was watching this podcast. People were talking about how in the past it took thousands of tens of thousands of people to bring a company up to a billion dollar valuation. And then more recently, it was it was hundreds, thousands and then hundreds. Instagram or one guy with a baggy 20. t-shirt and mop of curly hair. Yeah, exactly. Instagram was under 20, I believe. And then these these uh, people on the show were projecting that now with the advent of AI, all it takes is three people to make a company a billion dollar valuation. You've got a CEO who sets a strategy and the vision. You've got a product manager who executes, and then you've got sort of an operations manager who does the day-to-day stuff. And then all the grunt work, the marketing, the finance, and the execution, that's going to be done by AI. So forget office space. We don't even need headcount. How do you feel about this trend? Well, uh, stroke my long white beard here. <laughs> I remember. I, I remember. I remember as a kid, I went to the offices of the National Railways of Mexico in Mexico City, a big skyscraper full of minions. Um, they, I remember they had computers that had that paper computer tape, whole banks of them, to do what now you can do with a pocket calculator. But all these floor after floor of secretaries typing things out. Uh, and I remember thinking about that in the um, in the 1990s, how I, I worked with a think tank where it was just me, one other guy, and a secretary, and we put out publications, you know, routine, you know, weekly, monthly publications, books, we or conferences we organized. It was three people, and it, it, keeping track of things that would have taken floors of minions. Uh, you know, clipping away at desks to do before and, and all this machinery, the printing press of, of becoming a publisher and so on. Just amazing. And on the one hand, you had the destruction of all those jobs that went away. But on the other hand, you had this explosion of small businesses that now two or three people could do something that it would have taken an enterprise of 10,000 to do before. So you had, you know, a small number of very large enterprises lay off lots of people. You had a, a huge number of very small enterprises hire a bunch of people. So I'm optimistic about technology in general. I don't think that AI is going to impoverish everybody. If anything, the explosion of productivity that over time this will deliver will make it so that maybe working 10 or 15 hours a week would be what most people consider full time because it's just, our labor is that much more efficient with all these tools that we have. And what a wonderful world where the prime value people have is not flipping burgers or or typing in, you know, rote stuff that a robot can do, but thinking and creating. And all right, I don't want to wax too philosophical. I've actually written a couple of articles on, on AI. Um, one about the Turing test, I think is wrong and all this hype, of, you know, worry about that. But more importantly, uh, I think the, I haven't published this yet, actually. I'm, I'm giving you a sneak preview here. There will be an article available for free soon, which I call artificial stupidity. And that is having all these smart systems do all this stuff that can be done by road is one thing. But from everything I've seen so far, they have no judgment yet. When you ask an AI, you know, I, and I did this, you know, what, how will a recession affect the price of copper? And it gives me a reasonable paragraph. And I change it to gold. It's the same paragraph. And I change it to iron. It's the same thing with a few different words. Like it, there's no real understanding there. It goes out in the internet and finds whatever there. And surprise, surprise, it turns out that the internet is full of bullshit. Sorry, can I say that on your show, David? It's, I think it's fine. I, the noise to signal ratio is very important here. So you've got these so-called smart systems that are imbibing this you know, fire hose, more than a human could ever read of all this information. Well, if most of that is, is noise instead of signal, you're going to get you know, the garbage in, garbage out problem smack you upside head. And uh, this sneak preview, but... Um, <laughs> It was really clinched this for me. It's very personal, David. Somebody sent me an article and they put a, a bio in for me. They did me the favor of including my bio at the bottom. And the bio was almost entirely untrue. It, it said I was the founder of Tigray Wealth Management. There's no such company. And it said I was a Wharton School graduate from University of Pennsylvania. I never went to those places. Like, it just made this shit up. Like, you know, it, I don't, I have no idea where it came up with this, but no judgment. And if you need your output to actually be true, <laughs> right? The, these uh, AI models have a long way to go yet. So 
I'm actually feeling great about my business, my whole business. I'm a due diligence guy. This is what I do. I help investors tell shit from Shinola. Sorry, you opened the dam. I've got that four letter word out. Um, and, and this is the opposite of what these AIs do. So I think investors, A, you need to be wary of content that's artificially generated and how, you know, be very, if you need the information to be accurate or true, you need to be very wary. And if you're going to invest in AI companies, which is not my specialty, I'm not a, a tech guru, you know, I think there's a lot of money to be made there as others do, but but heck if I know which companies are going to do it right. Well, let's bring it back to markets and the, and the Federal Reserve now. So I so bottom line, you're not super bullish on commercial real estate for a host of reasons. Uh, what can we learn from Sorry, central the, banks? Sorry, the commercial real estate was the symptom, David. The bottom line is I'm bearish oh, yes. on the economy. I think the yes, economy yes. is you're much right. weaker right. than it looks. I think the so-called strength in the labor market is not real. I mean, even, okay, claims just jumped up only one week. I get it. But that last labor report, that was such a blowout labor report. You look at what was the main hiring? It was government jobs, right? And then after that, you got leisure and hospitality. And manufacturing is negative. I, I think if you look at the real economy, anybody who's honest about it uh, has to see that there are certainly cracks in the armor there. And at the very least, that is a concern. This week, I, I'm in Canada. The, the Bank of Canada raised their interest rates earlier this week. And just today on Friday, uh, the labor market uh, report came out from Canada, from StatCan. The unemployment rate jumped up to 5.2%, which is the first time it's increased since, I believe, last year. Now, in the same week that the unemployment rate rose, the Bank of Canada raised their interest rates, which really got me thinking, what is the priority of central banks right now. I, I I know I'm generalizing here. I'm taking the Bank of Canada as an example, but keep in mind they have similar mandates in, sure. in, in bringing down sure. inflation to 2% as the US Federal Reserve. There's several rabbit holes we can go down here. I, just real quick, one really interesting thing about this is it wasn't just the Bank of Canada, it was also down under. The Australians delivered a surprise rate hike and that really you know had the market take a step back and reconsider whether or not the Fed which had been largely expected to pause, whether it will. Uh, I, I think the Fed is independent from other central banks. So I really don't see these two data points as being quite the big deal that many traders took them to be, but something to think about. The other thing is, and to be fair, <laughs> it's hard for me to think of being fair to central bankers. I think the lot probably shall be put in jail, but to be fair, it, you know, they make a decision. The data doesn't come out till afterwards. That's hardly their fault. And we all know about long and variable lags. I just talked about it myself. So clearly, you know, this, the, bank, the Canadian decision to hike rates this week did not cause the employment rate to pop two days of course, later. You of know, course. That report two days later was from four, so on. So, you know, I kind of understand a little bit. Um, but I think that actually underscores the importance that people... I saw some talking head on Bloomberg, I think it was yesterday, saying, well, when is the statute of limitations on long and variable lags? You know, here we are a year and a half later and the economy hasn't blown up. Well, actually, it turns out that the average for the long and variable lags is 18 to 24 months, which fits with my expectation of the brown stuff hitting the fan by the end of this year. We'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this one takes longer. But to to insist that, well, nothing bad has happened so far. Therefore, everything is fine. I mean, that's just silly. It makes no logical sense. And anybody with any experience in the real world knows that it's it's like the joke, uh, our friend Antonio at Resource Talks, said, you know, the, the broker who jumps out the window in a skyscraper in New York, and jumps out the 100th floor window, and he hits, to, you know, he's falling through the air, the 50th floor, he says, well, so far, so good. Let, let, let me ask you, okay, let me ask you more directly. Now, there's, 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 there's two a lot of different camps here when it comes to the Federal Reserve. One group thinks that the Federal Reserve will pause rates, rate hikes, because that's just a logical thing to do after a 500 basis point hike. And um, and the Fed's own staff has projected a mild recession later this year. The other camp believes that the inflation rate has not yet come down to the 2% target. And so therefore, it's still hot by the Fed standards. And so rate hikes will be logical to bring, more rate hikes will be logical to bring down inflation to its 2%. Which camp are you in? I'm in camp hawkish pause. So, you know, bearing in mind, I'm not a Fed whisperer. I don't pretend to know, right? But, it, and I, the logical thing, I think, has almost nothing to do with it. I, I think the data here that, that 
pushes me into this direction is the the Fed speak that we got. The last Fed speakers before the blackout were both in the hawkish pause camp. And the idea, I think, what they're trying to do, I mean, they understand that they are trying to, you know, guide the economy. And that includes the markets and expectations and things. And and they have told us that their forward guidance, i.e. jawbone, is a policy tool. So it's not just that, oh, they're just chatting and they're just answering questions from people like you or me or whatever, or, or, or you know, they're, they're trying to push things in a certain direction with their words. So if that's Fed policy and the latest words that we got uh, from voting members include this idea of it's a pause, but not as a precursor to a pivot, it's a pause while we consider how much higher with the next rate hikes. So that would be my guess is that we're, you know, they're telling us in a way that that's what they're going to do. It's it's not pause and therefore celebrate. They're going to, Powell's going to do his very best to say, we paused, but we're going to raise again. You know, this, this isn't the end. We're not done. They've got work to do. Inflation isn't anywhere near our target. Uh, but long and variable lags. We want to go easy. We want to we 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 want to try to avoid excessive harm or unnecessary harm. So we're going to raise more, just not today. And then next time, I suspect they'll do the same thing. Oh yeah, yeah, we're still not done. Inflation's still too high, but just not today. Long and variable lags. And then something will break. Systemic risk will happen. And I think they do pivot at that point. I, what my difference with the mainstream is I don't think the Fed pivots because it beats inflation or because inflation gets down below 3% or something like that, and they can afford to ease up on the brakes. I think that they actually do stay higher for longer until something else that they can't ignore breaks. The, the, okay, let me let, let me make you a statement and please agree or disagree with this. The statement that the Fed will keep hiking until something breaks, that assumes that they will stop once this thing that breaks is something in their purview of interest. Meaning if it's something like real estate and they don't really care about real estate, or if it's something like Bitcoin and they don't really care about Bitcoin, they're gonna keep hiking, right? What are the mandates of the Federal Reserve to contain in, to contain inflation and to maximize employment? One could argue that if neither of those things are breaking, right, they'll just continue on its course. Yeah, no, I get that. And I do think that it's a mistake for mainstream equities investors, stock market guys, to assume that the Fed will rescue them. I think as long as inflation remains high and it or elevated, even 4% inflation, if it got there, that's still high. And, and for many reasons, including government debt that we've talked about, other reasons, that's that is that is too high. They need to fight that. So for for mainstream investors to think the Fed will come rescue the market because the the S&P goes back into bear mode. I, I do think that is a mistake. So that's, again, my call is not that the Fed pivots because they win or because things are coming down, or certainly not because it, the mainstream investor wants them to. It's because they do break something. And here's the thing, you know, a mandate like inflation is very broad, but the full employment one is too. Anything that could affect employment is a reason for them to change policy. And what doesn't affect employment, right? You could even say, that's why they might care about the markets eventually, because people will lose their jobs. And so my my call on the pivot, the eventual pivot, and not someday, but I think this will happen this year, is against systemic risk. Powell himself has said that if it comes to something like the guilt crisis in the UK, if systemic risk rears its head, that is a reason for them to change their policy direction. So I think... I think the narrative that, uh, you know, the soft landing narrative is wrong. I think that that doesn't mean, therefore, um, I think that means that higher for longer stays until they are forced to change it by systemic risk. Mm -hmm. What's your view on inflation? I do think that we're still in the period of high base rate, uh, sorry, um, base effects. So, and I, I've been right about that. I mean, I, some... Famous gold bugs have been talking about how inflation is just going to keep going higher and higher and higher. And since last year, I think you and I have spoken about this. I've, I've said that the, you know when you had a whole year in 2022, over 7%, that made it very difficult for this year's numbers, even if it's the same high inflation. The comparison year over year is much more difficult. And that has proven true. Uh, it, it, it won't be till after the summer that the peak base effects start cooling off. 
So I, I do think that other things being equal, we're likely to see lower nominal reports. Um, and even the core, so-called core numbers, those lagged you know, like a year behind the headline numbers. Well, that's more than a year in our past too. So we can see core numbers start to come down with base effects as well. But that doesn't mean that our prices that we pay for in the food store or anything else are really going to get any cheaper. Um, what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is don't be fooled by somewhat lower inflation prints. If the It's like my other famous cartoon of the mountain, right? The mountain climber gets to a shoulder in the mountain and the steep climb is suddenly, it's not so steep anymore. He says, oh, peak inflation, but, but he's still going up. Do you think the commodities markets, and we'll talk about commodities in more detail in just a bit, but do you think the commodities markets are signaling lower inflation, if not outright disinflation? Let's let's just off the top of my head, coppers t- come down, lumbers pretty much collapsed from its all-time highs. It's more or less people have said it's more or less normalized to pre-pandemic levels, but it's come down like something like eighty percent from its highs. Yep, yep. Um, no, I, I get it. Uh, natural it, it, gas has come down. Uh, what are these markets signaling? I think they're signaling recession, and whether or not that signals anything about inflation is is not the same question. You know, the mainstream treats inflation and economic growth as the same thing. You know, that's why the Fed's policy is to cool the economy because they think inflation is a result of of economic activity. So, (laughs) you know, and it's funny that we see stagflation reported like de facto around the world. Europe is in official recession now and inflation is still high. And this, like according to these textbooks or according to these models, it's not possible. It doesn't even exist. So why any of these people even still have a job is beyond me. But I think I said on on with you before you, you left Gitgo, I said going into a recession, the industrial minerals and commodities always get whacked. And I was I was right about that. I think that the reality of the deepening global recession is affecting commodities prices. And okay, lately in the last few prints, inflation has started to come down, but the correction in in metals and industrial minerals started way before that. So I I don't think that it's really primarily about inflation at all. Now, now the lower metals prices or oil prices will help fight inflation eventually, as long as they last, because input costs will trickle through. But that takes months and months to go through the, the system. So except for oil prices, you know, oil goes down and the gas pump tends to go down pretty quickly. Whereas, you know, the copper price being down, that's going to take a while for the, you know, the copper to be made into wires and other things to show up in gadgets, to show up in, you know, consumer prices. Um, so the takeaways would be one, we still haven't gotten the mainstream agreeing with me yet about this recession. So I do think that there's more pain ahead for industrial metals and minerals and even oil. Uh, I'm very bullish on things like copper and oil, as you know, but I'm not, I've am i told my clients, I'm not putting any money at risk in either of those or anything industrial at all until the recession denial goes away. What, so, what, are, your, what are your strongest conviction assets right now then? For, let's let me say, finish the answering the months. question. I'll, I'll answer okay. that. So, so the, so the, so the other thing is, don't assume that these lower prices are going to cure inflation. It, it is eventually a push in the right direction. But if I'm right about the, the Fed breaking something else and the government pivoting back towards easy money policy, then the amount of new money printing and easier money lending, credit expansion, all that stuff comes into play way before these price, before the, the lower commodities prices can play through to commercial uh, prices. So... You asked favorite commodities? It could be any asset. could be, you know, commodities, could be non-commodities. Okay. Well, actually, so th- that's a, a fair starting point, too. And it's something I like to remind people of is I'm a due diligence guy. I specialize in commodities and metals and mining in particular. That doesn't mean I think people should own nothing else. And we, we talked about pain in commercial real estate, but actual like residential real estate, th- the demographics behind that are immensely powerful, these generations coming into that home buying phase. Um, you know, th- if there's pain due to high interest rates in the residential side, I could see that as a terrific opportunity. Now, I'm not a real estate guy, so I, I can't advise people, you know, where do you buy the right kind of real estate? 
I'm just saying I can see opportunities and things beyond metals and mining. Uh, for that part of your portfolio that you are interested in putting into commodities, metals, and mining, then I would be happy to be your due diligence guy. So in my wheelhouse, right now, it's quite simple, David. It's gold, silver, uranium, nothing else. And that's because I think we're going deeper or the recession will become undeniable. There will be more pain to come. More things will break. And the monetary metals would do well in that environment. And uranium, because of things with that industry and the long-term contracts being signed now, I think is much more recession resistant than any other mineral out there. And the stock markets have been on a tear. We'll talk about that. If you're reading headlines that the bull market has returned. Is that true? I mean, objectively speaking, it's gone up about 20% year to date. Right. Or so, since last right. year. So if you look at the S&P, you know, that is a true statement. But it's one of these things where you can use a fact to tell people something that is egregiously untrue. And in this case, you've got a half a dozen or seven of the highest flying stocks that are responsible for most of the gains. And even the mainstream people know this. You know, the, the talking heads on Bloomberg and Yahoo and other places, they're, they're all talking about how these high flying stocks have driven the overall market. And if you take those out, uh, the stocks are down for the year. So, and it's funny, it, it, they talk about bad breadth and it, it makes me think about bad breath in the market. Yeah, that's that's an apt metaphor. You know, It stinks. I don't want to buy a market where only a handful of companies are generating the lion's share of the gains. Everything else is flashing red. This is a negative signal. And and by the way, there's companies that are are doing so well. You know, how many of them are are how how many of those have stories that really matter? The, the craze of the day is AI, which we talked about a moment ago. And not only do I think a lot of what is called AI really isn't, and you know, uh, artificial stupidity is a real thing that I think people need to worry about. There's just this this bandwidth. I, I heard people on on I think it was Yahoo Finance. They were laughing, laughing about how many uh, the the word count and earnings reports, and how a company. I think the average number of times AI was mentioned in the in the tech sector corporate uh, earnings uh, releases was like sixty seven, you know, <laughs> or something like that. It was, it was just this amazing number. They're throwing the AI in there, and it's like when when companies just started throwing blockchain in there and, and the share prices would go crazy because they said blockchain. You remember Eastman Kodak announced a plan to do something. So who knows what, but something with blockchain. Eastman Kodak, this isn't a penny stock. It doubled on their news that they were thinking about doing something with blockchain, right? And you know the comparisons that people have made with the dot-com bubble, I think it's very, very apt. You know, Real things came out of that. Amazon came out of that, right? There were innovations there that mattered. The internet mattered. Artificial intelligence, at some point, you know, that's a real thing that will, I think, change the world. I'm not poo-pooing the idea. But which stocks are you going to buy today? You know, is a is a 250 percent? Sorry, 250 PE. You know, that's insane. <laughs> are you telling me? Are you telling me you're not going to buy the Apple Vision Pro headset? For thirty five hundred dollars, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I looked at that and I looked at the demo and I thought I could use that. Yeah. Now, now it, in, in my income bracket, thirty five hundred in that big a deal. You know, maybe if it was thirty five thousand or something, I I might hesitate. Thirty five hundred is not a terribly large expense for me. But the I've noticed this is a this, this is a side point, David. But I've noticed that there's excellent dictation software on my phone. I can dictate notes to my phone. But I can't on my computer. It's very clunky if I want to try to dictate to my computer. And, um, you know, I have issues with my keyboards and stuff. And I would like to. So, you know, the, if you're the, watching this right now, send Lobo some help. Send him some <laughs> recommendations for dictation software well, he can download. Comment well, below. Or, but, yes. but, you know, it's partly, I don't know if it's early arthritis or something. I just can't type the way I used to, I, is, right. is the point. I, you know, I used to be able to type, I don't know, 80 words a minute or whatever it was. And now it's, it's, I can do that, but I have to go back and correct everything. So if I could just speak it, it would be better. Anyway, oh, and I did have dictation software before, and it was so clunky and hard to use. But but the way they showed it with this headset, it was seamless. Like, I, I, I can see a, a point where for very few things, I would actually need my keyboard. And for me, that would actually be a plus. I would pay for that. 
to be able to do, you know, I don't, I don't care about watching movies virtually or whatever. Wearing a headset that long would probably give me a headache at that weight. But I could see that helping me with my work. But anyway, the headset is not really an AI story. And the AI story, I think, is very specifically part of why- I brought it up because it's an innovation story. You brought up a very key word, which is innovation. I, I get it. And- but, but the takeaway is, or what I'm trying to say is, this so-called bull market is, is a bear in bull's clothes. And the AI is the uh, tailor for that costume. So bottom line, how do you feel about the stock market overall, given that- like you said, half a dozen stocks propping it up. You're right. If you st- if you strip away the tech stocks from the S and P 500, and there's ETFs for this, it's flat. Yes. It's been flat on the year. Um, it's so, flat to slightly down. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take the macro discussion we've had so far and factor that into your outlook to the S and P. And we have to be inclusive of the fu- of the of the tech stocks. Let's take the S and P 500 inclusive of everything. You know, what's your what's your outlook then? Okay. So. My, how do I feel? I remember that Star Trek movie where Spock's mother asks him, how does he feel? And he's totally stumped because he's not supposed to feel anything. Um, <laughs> my, my thoughts are that the near term is actually very choppy. And I could actually see the markets continuing higher, the broader markets. The story here with the AI narrative is very strong. Um, and if the Fed does pause, even if it's a hawkish pause, even if they say, we're still going to raise rates more. We promise we're going to raise rates more, but just not today. Even if they say that, you know, uh, uh, there will be some rejoicing on Wall Street. So even though I think the markets are headed down before the end of this year, I think we will see more pain. I think we'll see the bloom come off the rose, whatever. In the very nearest term, um, idiocy could reign, I suppose. And by the way, I, as as bullish as I am on gold and silver in the this year and uranium as well um the insanity could affect them as well there's there's a bear case to be made for gold in the very nearest term for people who call me a permable on gold you know the the weakening in europe makes the fed look you know more hawkish and uh you know the the weakening of the dollar that by the way we talked about before and i was right about earlier this year that has come undone um and if uh, the rates uh, are n- never mind raised anymore. If they're just held where they are, and the base effects cause inflation to come down, then real rates will be more positive. I, you know, they don't correlate the way they used to, which is a whole other conversation. But they do matter. Um, so there's near term until the systemic risk. There are, uh, you know, there there are bearish signals in there for even gold and silver. So I'm not saying sell all your gold and silver stocks or whatever. I'm saying, you know, don't be surprised if if gold breaks lower and takes silver down with it in the months immediately ahead. In fact, the thing that might help the most would be central banks. You know, right now, if you if you you look at interest rates and you look at the dollar and other things going on, it's kind of bearish in the near term for gold. But gold has held on to near that two thousand dollar price level. I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is it's central bank buying. Gold has historically performed well during recessions. Can you expect that this time again? I do. Short and sweet. Yeah. Okay. And, and and well, let me give you a little bit more too. It's not just a recession, and it's not always the case. But I think this recession, well, while, while history doesn't repeat, it often does rhyme. This is going to rhyme a lot with the seventies. I think we're going to have a recession with inflation much higher than people think, and they're going to say, "Well, what does this remind me of?" And it's going to be the 70s. It's the closest analog we have. I know that our friend Lynn Alden likes to talk about the 40s and so on, but I think most people are going to look at the 70s and they're going to say, well, what did well in the 70s? Well, heck, you know, gold and silver went nuts. Um, and there are other comparables. You had the oil shock then, and you know, we've got higher oil prices now and the war then. Um, you've got you had a demographic push then, and we have that now. I think there are actually some pretty good parallels here. And that this doesn't mean that it has to be this way, but I think the odds favor uh, a real, uh, if not panic or mania, I, I think the odds favor a lot more people deciding that it's reasonable to allocate to gold who have never considered it before. Let, let me just point something out and please push back if you like. Uh, I've heard this comparison to the 70s a lot. Keep in mind that 
first of all, uh, two points. During all recessions that we've seen in, 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 in the last 70 years, all recessions have seen the inflation rate come down. That's not to say we have had deflation. It's just the rate of inflation has come down during the recession. Um, in the late 70s, it wasn't technically a recession yet. That was 80 and 81. Uh, the late 70s had high inflation because, like you mentioned, the oil shock. It wasn't because there was booming growth. It was because there was a shock in supply. So I'm just wondering, right now, people are making this comparison. We don't have a shock in the supply of any one particular commodity, like oil, for example, that well, will really no, drive up high inflation. I mean, no, uh, no the, the war has put a shock in there. And okay, the oil is still flowing. Yeah. And, you know, they're selling it to India. Russia's selling it to India, and Europe is buying refined products from it's India. It's just we so see oil... pictures of the late 70s of people lining up at gas stations yeah, in the U.S. Right, and, yeah. you know, we, that we, hasn't we, happened yet. The, yeah. The powers that be have gotten better at hiding the illnesses. <laughs> um, but, but, but the fact is, you know, people are saying, well, you know, gee, we got all this stuff and oil is down from 120 to only $70 or, you know, 80, 70, whatever. But a couple of years ago, we were looking at 60 as a high price. And this, if if oil stays in the sub $100 range for the next year, that is a high oil price. <laughs> that is that is historically that's a very high oil price. So that would mean uh, again paradigm shift, one way transition. We are in a higher oil price environment. I could see a recession shocking oil back below 60 briefly. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't think we're going to see negative oil prices again as we did in 2020, but I think that would be brief. And um, you know, given that the the whole ESG agenda is starving that industry of capital, I find myself you know very persuaded that we're going to be looking at plus or minus triple digit oil prices going forward. Let, 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 okay. Wow. Okay. So let me double to triple digit oil prices going forward. Let me let me just. I like our side banter, so I'm going to ask you a side question. Do you do you own a vehicle? Do you drive a car? I do, and it and it's a gas guzzler. It's a gas. I, I live it's a, in Puerto okay. Rico, so I'm I'm actually <laughs> in the market for a Tesla Cybertruck. If they ever actually build one of those things, I love the idea of a stainless steel tank that I can take <laughs> to the supermarket. And you want to bang my Cybertruck with your car door? Knock yourself out. It's going to hurt you more than it hurts me. <laughs> going to take up two two spots in the parking lot of the grocery store. But my question is, well, I guess you kind of answered my question. Is there an oil price high enough that would incentivize you to switch to an EV? Let's say you didn't have your eyesight on the Cybertruck. You were just not in the market for an EV. You're just a regular consumer who's putting gas in your car. At what point would you say this is enough's enough? I'm switching to an electric. Well, I, I, I'm not the average Joe, and I don't mean to yeah. sound, you know, braggadocio or whatever. Sure, but sure. I really don't even I don't even look at oil prices. You know, I I remember when I didn't have two quarters to clink together in my pocket, I would see like a, a, a cheap local gas station with 96 cent gas, and another one across the street, an Exxon or some high brand that was like a dollar fifteen. And I'd see a bunch of cars in the Exxon and all they had to do was cross the street and they get cheaper gas. And I just could not understand that. How could these people not see this? And now, I mean, it's it's not just that I'm super rich or whatever, I'm not that, but like I drive my car once every two weeks, you know, it, it's just there because it's convenient. It doesn't matter to me. And I, I sincerely, I don't even look at the price. I just go and I fill it up. I use so little of it, it doesn't matter to me. So it's, I'm not a good person to ask. Um, I think it, it, it becomes very complicated though, David, because as you know, there's these subsidies, there's the new subsidies that the Model 3 you know, qualified for right. and so on. Absent those subsidies, it's a much higher price that it takes to make that decision. So for, and then there's, and there's other complications. I live in an apartment building and where am I going to charge that thing? I need to get permission from the building to put the right, I don't know what the voltage is and what kind of plug, like my garage in the, I have a, there's a little outlet. I can, a little, you know, 60 watt light bulb in there. I'm, I'm not going to put an adapter in that and try to charge my cyber truck. No, that'll take you 20 hours. Uh, so, so, you know, how does that even work for, for me? And, and by the way, you know, there isn't a hydrogen pumping station on the entire island either. So in a way I'm saying, don't ask me, but in a way I'm saying, these are real considerations that I think other people have to consider besides just the price. Let's end on Bitcoin now. Uh, I know you've been following this market. The, the SEC, as you know, has sued Binance. They sued Coinbase. 
Um, there seems to be this, and people in the crypto community have called this a war against crypto. I wonder how much of this is politically driven. Well, it's, <laughs> political motivations for government agencies is the sort of thing you only find out about in the in the kiss and tell book 30 or 40 years later. So we're not going to know in an investable time frame, David. But I, even though I'm not a, a crypto hodler, I, I did I did play with some Ethereum, some play money. I did play with it a bit, but I'm I'm not a, a big speculator in that space. Um I think it's uh it's unfortunate for gold bugs to be cheering the SEC for smacking down the cryptos in this way. Uh, because the industry did ask for regulation. And instead of clear-cut rules, this, you know. Do you hear the rules, abide by them, and if you don't, we'll smack you down. Instead, they ask for the rules, and then they get served. And it, you know, regulation through litigation or prosecution, I think, is is um, not just the wrong way to do it. It's not just bad for cryptos. I think it's bad for civil society. I think it's bad for rule of law. This this is the agency has kind of gone rogue here on whatever agenda they have, whether it's because the governments hate cryptos and want to crush them, or whether it's just Gensler's personal vendetta, or I don't know what's going on there. But this way of doing business, it's not just bad for crypto, it's it's bad for America. And I think, you know, gold bugs should actually, uh, you know, uh, rise above the schadenfreude and, and focus on the real enemy here. And by the way, the real enemy is not cryptos, and I know people are annoyed because a lot of momentum chasing money went out of gold, perhaps, and into cryptos. But cryptos are a market response to government mismanagement of the money supply. And at the end of the day, it shouldn't be you know, Bitcoin maximalists or, or gold bugs who decide what money people use. It should be the market. Well, uh, Lobo, very thorough discussion. Thank you very much. Where can people find out more about your work uh, and learn more from you directly? Well, thank you very much, David. It's uh, we, You must have missed me. This has been a longer conversation I think we've had for a long time. Yeah, so, oh, for sure. I'm cramming months of no Lobo into one <laughs> segment. <laughs> there you go. Well, independentspeculator.com. I won't spam you too much with an ad here. I'll just say if you sign up for the free weekly newsletter, you'll get one free weekly newsletter. No flood of daily spam. And if you like it, maybe you'll decide to hire me as your due diligence guy. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to the next time we speak. And uh, best of luck for now with your newsletter. Appreciate you coming on the show. Yep, thank you, David, and you too. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe.